as a general rule, no one's coming to save you. What you just said might disappoint a few people. So many people are talking about becoming entrepreneurs. They've not been under the wing of an entrepreneur. Biggest brands in the world, they're all sales organizations. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the podcast in partnership with Najahi Events. Now, today's guest, Daniel Priestley. I've been trying to get this guy on the show for about two years now, and it never seems to have worked out. But he is a great storyteller. He's also an incredible entrepreneur, and he knows business. So I really want you to pay attention. Let me give you a bit of a backstory, okay? Um, he's the best-selling author. I think he's got six books now, starting with nothing. He built a successful multi-million dollar business in Australia, the UK, then Singapore. He's the co-founder and CEO of Dent Global, so check them out. One of the world's top business accelerators for entrepreneurs and leaders, and the co-founder and chairperson of Score App, which you absolutely need to check out without a shadow of a doubt a marketing tech platform. He's written six best-selling books on business and leadership and spoken all over the world. He's named in the top 10 business advisors in the UK by Enterprise Nation and one of the top 25 entrepreneurs in London uh, in the Smith & Williamson Power 100 Awards. His mission is to develop entrepreneurs who stand out, scale up and make a dent. You're going to love this one. Get this music cued. Let's get started. Daniel Priestley. And lastly, thank you to Najahi Events, who have been sponsoring us now on the podcast for over a year. Najahi bring motivational speakers to the region to help inspire, educate, and motivate you to achieve better success and live a better life. Daniel, <laughs> welcome to the podcast. It feels like I've I've kind of known you for a long time. Um, I tried to get you on the show some years ago. I think it was through COVID and, and being in Australia, you're a million miles away in terms of time zones and stuff. But you're here in Dubai and we've been able to grab you. So I've a brilliant Najahi to thank for that. Yeah, absolutely great. Now, the, the whole world of kind of like personal development and marketing online and stuff like that has been has been kind of to some degree overdone for a lot of people over the years. It's almost like they get sucked into that world and then they get overwhelmed with it. And you see these people selling courses and uh, you know whether it's build your business or get a gazillion followers or whatever, whatever it might be. And people get super excited about it, but invariably many people don't tend to really win in that space. And I find it quite similar to most businesses. You know, it's like with the podcast, mm. people say there's lots of podcasts, but there aren't many that have done more than 20 episodes people kind of give up pretty soon. And what I think about that, it's like, do they give up because they didn't really want to do it in the first place? Or do they give up because it's just too complicated for them? The steps are difficult for them to follow. Um, or were they just trying to find some get-rich-quick scheme and uh, they paid their money and that's not what happened? Well, it could be a combination of all those things. Uh, you know, it, we've all been excited by a, a good sell, a sales pitch uh, and everyone's kind of run towards something that wasn't right for them. And um, and life gets in the way and success is hard. And um, I saw a really nice uh, quote the other day, which was, um, don't get excited by the trophies, get excited by the tedious repetition that went into the win. Um, you know, and it's like behind every, you know, great success story, there's a lot of tedious repetition that goes in and a lot of, a lot of stuff that's not very glamorous. And um, we glamorize success and we glamorize, you know, the outcomes and we glamorize, certainly glamorize the trophies, you know, the Ferraris and the this, that, and the others. But actually, you've got to know the steps. I've got little kids, and we play with a lot of Lego. And you think about it like this. You tip out this box of Lego on the, on the carpet, and there's pieces everywhere. And you look at the front of the box, and you see this end result, this picture that is what you're meant to be trying to build. Mm -hmm. And then you look at all the pieces on the carpet, and you think, well, wait a second. Where on earth am I meant to start with that? And it's only when it's broken down into a set of steps where literally they say, first put this piece on this piece and then this piece on this piece and then this and this. And then you, if you can stick with that process, you actually end up with something that does look a lot like what's on the front of the box. That's happening in the world of entrepreneurship a lot at the moment. So we go on Instagram, there's the front of the box, right? And that's what it's meant to look like. We follow someone's account and, you know, they've got the boat and the car and then this and that. And you go, oh, wow, that's the box. That's what I want. Uh, and then you go, okay, look, let's look at the pizza p pieces, and uh, we think, okay, do I do I need a CRM system? Do I need uh, do I need a sales team? 
Am I meant to have a CFO? Am I meant to raise capital? Am I meant to do a financial forecast? Am I meant to uh, run some Facebook ads? Like well, these are all the pieces. What am I meant to do with them and in what order? Um, so I think a big part of success is there is this complexity issue. There's this um, issue of sequencing. Um, you've also touched on overselling, overhyping, um, you know, which sort of takes people off their path. Uh, so for all of those reasons, I think success is a rare event. Hmm. When you think about most people, they, they, they want, they want the solution to the problem and they, they, they want it quick. And even if they've got the steps, invariably the pace isn't quite as, as fast as, as they would like. And I suppose it's like in life, isn't it? Everyone wants to lose weight really quickly. Yeah. You know, to lose weight properly, you know, if I wanted to lose eight kilos, it's probably going to be, I don't know, four, six, eight months worth of, 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 of pain and sacrifice and, uh, and, and dedication to get there. Most, most people in business, that, that time horizon is the bit for me that seems to, seems to run out with them. There's the time horizon. There's also, it's, you know, business is a lot like a tightrope walk that um, you can go a little too far to this extreme or that extreme. Um, so one element is delayed gratification. And the other element is giving yourself enough little mini rewards that you stay with it. Um, you know, going back to my example of my kids, you know, I watch them playing Mario Brothers and very rapidly you get rewards along the way. Uh, you hit the box and out it pops the coins and all these sorts of things. And um, I think a lot of people don't stick with it because they don't get enough short-term rewards. They don't see enough benefits up front. Um, and it's this kind of weird balance of trying to trick your brain into getting some short-term dopamine um, while also having delayed gratification yeah. and long-term vision. Uh, yeah. The, you know, the, the other thing too is you need a bit of luck. Like there's got to be a lucky break somewhere and there's got to be, you've got to have the wind in your sails and, and get a, you know, a little bit of that momentum going. Momentum can either work for you or against you. You know, when you've got momentum, life's easy and the slightest thing in the right direction takes you miles forward. And when momentum's against you, you know, almost nothing you can do can, can, uh, result in anything positive. It's just a, you've got the momentum against you and <laughs> everything sucks and everything fails. Mm, I certainly know that feeling. Maybe that's all we all have over the years. Okay, take me back. Let's let's learn learn about your story. Obviously, you've written books. You're really successful at what you do. But you, you're just a, a a kid from Australia. There's nothing fancy about you. You're nothing. not born with a silver spoon. You don't have wealthy parents. You didn't no. inherit a you know a stock portfolio. <laughs> no inherited property portfolio. Um, very normal Australian upbringing. Obviously, that's a great upbringing by most people's standards globally. Um, but I went to normal standard schools. Um, I left home at, uh, 18 and one week with absolutely nothing. Um, I, you know, I started out pizza delivery driving and working behind bars and running little parties and, um, and, and literally, you know, uh, you know, at, at, you know, my start to adult life was, um, you know, getting a parking ticket and that being absolutely devastating, you know, like a 30, $30 parking ticket, really meaning that I probably can't eat this week and that sort of stuff. Like, you know, no buffer. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, I was literally living on, uh, you know, I hate those rags to riches things, especially from an Australian, uh, point of view, but you know, I, I lived on a garage floor with a mattress on the floor and, um, roll up, um, thing. It was fun. Like we, we loved having five of us in a three bedroom house, but, um, but yeah, it was, you know, I started out at that, that, that kind of level. Yeah. And so when you think about your first career decision, what, what was that when you say career? I don't mean just that jobs to make, make ends meet. What was your career? So uh, career was, I, I dropped out of university um, and I uh, had this opportunity to go and work for a startup. And it was a guy who was um, 37 years old. I was 19 years old. So he seemed a lot older and a lot wiser. Um, <laughs> Uh, he was a young whippersnapper. Did you know? Yeah. He was a young whippersnapper. Now that I think <laughs> about it, uh, but um, he basically he, there was no business name, bank account, um, or business plan or any of this. He was just starting a business, and um, I got roped in as like employee number three um, on day one. But while we we're all figuring it out, I remember just sitting at this huge kitchen table, and we've got this um, map of the year, a, a yearly planner. And we just start with like, okay, we're going to do this launch event here and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. 
Anyway, it was a fast growth business. It went from zero to six million in the first uh, 12 months to 18 months. Um, we went from a beachside house in Noosa to inner city Melbourne office um, with 50, 60 employees. Um, and I was, I was really close with this guy. Um, so I had two years with him where I was right under his wing. Um, in year one, I was on his sales team, making sales, um, 70 calls a day type thing. Mm -hmm. In year two, I set up a regional division of his business. So he was doing Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, and I went out and did some regional cities, um, satellite sort of uh, cities. And I ran my own P&L from 20 to 21. Um, we did like $750,000 with 250 grand worth of profit. It was really profitable, little regional side of the business. Um, I get to about 21 years old. I have a silly conversation with him and I say, um, I want shares in the business. I, you know, I've been there from the beginning. And he says to me, if you want shares in a business, go start your own business. So I did. So at 21, I launched my own company. I copy all of his business ideas and basically launch a copycat business to him. Um, and it takes off uh, 1.3 million in the first year, 400 grand worth of profit, 10.7 million in year three, um, you know, and we're, we're flying, you know, I'm 24 years old and we're doing a million dollar a month type thing. So, um, basically entrepreneur from 21 years old, um, and, uh, and, and then since then built, built businesses around the world. I've lived in Singapore and London, um, and Australia, and, uh, we've opened up offices in the U S and Canada and, um, yeah, built, uh, today I have eight companies, um, that, that are in the group, um, and yeah, I've built and sold companies uh, along the way. That that experience you had in the early days when you went to work for this very old man, yeah. thirty-seven <laughs> years old. <laughs> I've got a funny story about something. Someone I can't even tell you on camera, so I'll tell you afterwards. But you 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 went into that business, and and he was figuring it out. You were all trying to work out what to do and how to do it, and and, and trying to make make it work. Did you class yourself at that point as an entrepreneur or did you just class yourself as an employee and be just happy to be sucking in the information that you were gathering? Um, I, my self-identity was entrepreneur or entrepreneurial. Um, in university, I'd been running nightclub parties and um, I'd had this amazing experience of promoting these dance parties and, um, and making, you know, a thousand to three thousand in a night and, um, uh, and just having, being the cool guy for the night, right? So in my mind, I linked up that entrepreneurship was really cool. Um, you know, it got me girlfriends and it got me uh, prizes and cool things and great photos. And, and people thought of me as an entrepreneur at university because I was this guy running these cool parties. Um, even the university lecturers who didn't have businesses of their own running a business course, they were asking me about what it feels like to run a business, right? So I felt very entrepreneurial. I was reading a lot of business books and entrepreneur books, and I felt like I was doing an entrepreneur apprenticeship with, with this company and that, um, ultimately I was learning what I needed to learn to go be an entrepreneur. So it wasn't an accident that I ended up starting a business. I, that was always what I wanted to, what I wanted to do. The reason I asked that question is that when you, when you get, you know, I was a number two in a company and a number three in a company for, for many years. And I never regarded myself as an entrepreneur. I just thought I was a, a salesman, um, uh, a leader, but yeah, ne I, the, the buck really didn't stop with me until yeah. I actually did start yeah. my own company. And yeah. then, then that was a very, very different emotional or psychological experience. Mm. Was I wanna, that the same for you? Well, one thing I want to highlight there is that. So many people are talking about becoming entrepreneurs and they've not done number two uh, roles. Um, they've not been under the wing of an entrepreneur. There's no entrepreneur apprentice that goes up, apprenticeship that's happened. And I, I just want to say probably the most valuable thing that I did was an entrepreneur apprenticeship under the wing of a, an experienced entrepreneur. I, I think it's a critical step that gets brushed over all the time. And I hear people saying, um, you know, I want to go start a business. And I ask the question, have you worked for an entrepreneur? Have you been number two in a similar business? You know, whatever business you want to go start, go do six months or 12 months working with an entrepreneurial team within arm's reach of an entrepreneur day to day and actually see if you do like it um, or whether you are ready for it. Because this whole like setting up a company and starting a business thing that might look, <laughs> look easy from a distance, 
But, you know, it's a completely different set of skills juggling something into existence. And most most of them don't work. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, my, my, my kids, one's just about to leave uni, but the, the oldest left university last year. And when she left, she's talking about the kind of company she wants to work for. And I'm like, well, all you do is you write to those people that own those companies and you say to them, I would like to come and work for you for free. Mm. Okay, I don't want anything from you, no payment. Okay, I just like to learn. I'll do anything you want me to do. Morning, noon and night, I'll make myself available. If after six months you think I'm of any value to you, maybe we can discuss an opportunity. Great strategy. Yeah, great strategy. Now, that's a great way for her to get into the business she wants to get into. When you speak to people that have been at work for 10 years that now want to start their own business, the thought of them doing that you know, which is still a great strategy so that they there's can... A similar, there's a similar strategy, which is to be a consultant to an entrepreneurial company at a low rate, you know, to, to find an entrepreneur that you want to emulate and say, hey, look, you know, this I've just I've just been working at this large corporate. I'm thinking of getting into uh, more SME territory and eventually becoming an entrepreneur. Can I come and do six months worth of consulting with you? You know, if you've been, if your background has been, you know, operations, let me come in and help with your operations. If your background sales and marketing, let me come in and work with your sales and marketing team. Yeah. And and you just, you know, give them a a day rate that's ridiculously low and just, just get yourself in there. Um, and you know, the funny thing about a ridiculously low day rate is that in corporate, you're actually on a ridiculously low day rate anyway, when you actually work out, you know, what a high salary is divided, you know, like 200 grand a year is about a grand a day. Um, which in consulting terms is, you know, pretty low. So, um, you know, you can, uh, you can give a, a, you can give a much lower sounding day rate than most people are used to and get yourself in and start seeing what it's actually like. Do you think psychologically it's challenging? I mean, you, you started very early and you didn't really know any different and that's why it became, I I think more natural for you. Yeah. I've not actually really known anything else. It's not like you and I both had a job where we've worked for, I don't know, my uh, last job, uh, Siemens for 20 years and then gone, right, Dan, should we start a business? You know? Yeah. My, my actual work history is pizza hut delivery driver, McDonald's crew trainer, uh, a barman at, at a bar. <laughs> these are these are the big jobs I've held down. <laughs> but when when we see those people that come out of that space and then want to go and start their own business, you know, you see a lot of this coaching and you know the, the consulting businesses that get started. I find that people are very poorly prepared. Hmm. They have an idea in their mind about what they want to try and achieve. They they want to come away from this shackles, as they seem to call it, of working in the corporate world <laughs> to have the freedom to work at their own pace well you know as well as i if you go and set your own business up that's an 18 hour a day job seven yeah. days a week. and you're and you're shackled to you know the new boss is the customer um you know and if you take on investment the new boss is your your investors so you know there's some different types of things i want to there's a clear distinction as well between a business and self-employed uh so you know if you're self-employed essentially consul- consulting or coaching or any of those sorts of stuff you're still effectively an employee. You're just breaking your time up between multiple organizations and hopefully you're getting a bit of a premium um, and maybe you're getting a little bit of location flexibility or something like that. But for most people, I I don't think of that as a business because it doesn't end up taking on a life of its own. Um, it's, you know, there is no brand at the end of it. There's no exitable entity. Um, you're not building an asset. Um, so... Uh, you know, or you're building marginal, negligible asset. Maybe you've got a few documents that you use, or something like that. But, but um, yeah, th- this is this is not going to be a life changing for most people. This is not going to be a life changing thing. You you go from having one master to four, <laughs> and actually, you go from one master f- to four plus the fifth master is pipeline. Trying to build pipeline so that if one of these four stops you've got someone in the pipeline. So you're constantly trying to juggle the needs of four or five different clients and also have some pipeline, um, which most people are woefully unprepared for, mm. like that, the level of stress of trying to manage those spinning plates. Got it. Okay, let's talk about building businesses online. That okay. be an area that you've got a little bit of expertise in and mastered, mastered that over the years. Yeah. Can I push back on that straight away? Mm-hmm. So I just don't think there's online or offline anymore. I think that's just a, a, a superfluous distinction. We don't need to be talking about online or offline. You know, when was the last time you were offline? 
when was the last time, you know, do you ever say I'm online now or I mean, are we online or offline right now? Mm, um, you know, it's just business. Um, if you, if you think, of, if you if you immediately think of online or offline, you've, you've really missed the point. Um, there's just businesses and they provide value to individuals and people buy stuff that's of value. And some of that is communicated online. Some of that's delivered online. Some of that's invoiced online. You'd be mad if you didn't use those tools. But the, the term online is almost like, I find that it's almost a proxy for, I don't actually want to meet my customers. Um, and that's a bad place to start. You need to start by licking their faces. You need to be up, or up close and personal. You, you've got to have those customers as close as you can possibly get to them. Um, and the best tech entrepreneurs and I know some billionaire tech entrepreneurs, the best tech entrepreneurs lick the customer's face. They are right up close. They, they sit next to their customers while they're using the product and they, you know, they, they, they want to be, you know, right up close to those customers. So I don't like the term online because I feel like a lot of people are using that as, oh, I just want this thing to work without me being there and I want the customers to be happy without me having to meet them or see them or talk to them. Mm. Really, really valid point. I respect that. Okay. Don't push back on anything else. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, strike one, Dan. You're off the podcast. Get out of here. So when we when we when we look at building businesses, what I what I found has evolved over the years. So I, I, I'll I'll take you on my journey. So I'm 53 years old. When I was 17 years old, I learned to sell office equipment in London. My patch was EC3. So I had one part of the city every morning. I would go knock on some doors, get some compliment slips, get the office manager's name and the uh, the equipment listings. And then I'd go back, get a, uh, a sandwich at the petrol station and a cup of tea. And then I would have to, 100 cold calls to make. And that was my life for the first 18 months. And again, as a youngster, like when you were, I didn't know any different. Okay. I learned how to handle rejection because I was taught a process and my listeners know what that is. And once, once I learned that process and understood I needed 99 no's to earn a yes, that was all cool with me. Um, I then went on to always think about business or for many years think about businesses. If you want to get clients, mm. you need to go hustle and hunt and find your clients. Yeah. And that was always the way. And if we if we go back to those days, people were receiving in the in the letterbox every day, 10, 15 envelopes every day. One was a bill, one might be a letter from someone nice, but the mm -hmm. rest were mail shots. Yeah. And the mail shots were, we, my mum would tear them up before opening them. Yep. Okay. A dear homeowner or whatever it was, you know, some of them handwritten. And so we're going to fool you. No. And that, that, that was how we did it. If, if not, then it was the ad, the advertising in the newspaper. Yep. And so, uh, or, or the yellow pages, which mm -hmm. was obviously big there. Do you remember well. fax broadcasting? Yeah. Fax, <laughs> well, I sold faxes. So I did, I, I knew about fax broadcasting. So we used to do Made that. Made people so mad. People yeah. hated fax broadcasting. <laughs> used to, just these things used to turn up. So all of these different methods were how do we how do we hunt how do we hustle how do we how do we reach out and find people mm. and then the world slowly started to evolve and it started to include this social media where mm. the, the, the 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 next line was well, you don't need to do that what you need to do is you need to create content and by creating content you're going to create a personal brand or a brand for your business and people are then going to come to you by creating that content and as Gary Vaynerchuk wrote a book about it, jab, 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 right hook, mm -hmm. you know, we, we know was that, that, that give, 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 then ask, give, mm -hmm. give, give, then ask, you know, create value for people, then ask. And then that, that was the, the, the formula. Mm -hmm. However, um, the control wasn't really with the, 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 the company that was running that marketing strategy because that audience they were trying to build in essence, wasn't their audience and could be taken to away from them at, at any Absolutely, point. Absolutely, yeah. So there was a lot of vulnerability around that as opposed to, if you go back to the real old times, I had two boxes on my desk. One was the A to Z, one was the January to December. Okay, the A to Z were my prospects. Mm -hmm. Okay, January to December were the callbacks. Yep. Uh, but they they were there. They yeah. weren't going anywhere. And okay, I called them back once a month and they'd say, oh, leave yep. me alone again and call me back in three months or whatever. Nowadays with people that have gone on to build social media audiences, they've then said, hold on a minute, why aren't my, why isn't my audience seeing my content? Mm -hmm. And so people have been frustrated from that because I've got my audience of a hundred, a thousand, a hundred thousand, whatever. Yeah. Surely if I make content, they should see it. Mm -hmm. But but those organizations thought otherwise and said, yes, of course they can if you pay us. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so that then happened to then the next step of, 
let's just run advertising campaigns to a targeted audience mm -hmm. that may be or could be or we hope will be interested in the product or service that we offer. Yeah. With mixed results. Yeah. And in most people's cases, with very mixed results. And that's down to two things, I think. A real lack of understanding of what's involved to make that really work. Mm -hmm. And also the modern day version of double glazing salesmen, which I call social media agencies, <laughs> which are organizations that are here in abundance here in the UAE, as in there are in the Everywhere. rest of the world, where people go to these agencies and the AC agency says, we will, for you, for this fixed retainer every month and this ad spend and 20% of your ad spend, whatever it might be, yeah. we will deliver X. Yeah. And in nine times out of 10 cases, they can't deliver X or they don't deliver X. And they say, hey-ho, either your product's a bit difficult to sell or yeah, we try. Or, or this marketplace is not right for you or nobody wants sales training or nobody wants, you yeah. know, whatever it may be. So that's the experience that I have had and many people have had along the way. Yeah. Now, I know your experience is different because you've learned from all of this and you, you've deployed different strategies. No, no, no. That, that, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a regular experience. That's yeah. a regular experience. Yeah. How do, how do people nowadays avoid the fear of being in that space and go, have I really got to trust another company that may or may not do this for me? Uh, well, I mean, that's a very specific question around trusting a particular company and you'd have to take it on a case by case basis. But but as a, as a general rule, no one's coming to save you, right? This idea that someone's going to come in with a white horse and, and, you know, barge through all barriers and, and get you an amazing result. It's nonsense. No one's coming to save you. They're there to make their payroll. They're, they're, they've got their business to run. So if you're going to, you know, buy into the fact that someone has this incredible expertise and wants to use it to make you famous, um, you, you know, you, then that's on you, you know, you've, you've got to, you've got a bit of, you've got to flush away a bit of wishful thinking when you're an entrepreneur and, and deal with reality. Um, so dealing with reality is that a lot of stuff has to go right. And it's almost too late, by the way, like, you know, we are almost at a cusp where those who have already built a profile will do well. And those who haven't will never do it. Um, because we have too much AI content coming in and we have too much other stuff and, and, and all the businesses that exist right now are suddenly armed to the teeth with these incredible attention weapons. And um, for, for anyone who's trying to get cut through, it's almost too late. Like it's the, this entrepreneur revolution window is rapidly closing. Um, so you've, you've got to be damn good at what you do these days. What you just said might disappoint a few people, <laughs> um, but, it, but it's a harsh reality. Mm. You know, when I, when I look at any of the businesses that I've got, we, we don't allow cold calling. However, there are many alternatives to cold mm. calling. And, and, and for me, I, I would rather call five referrals yeah. than make 100 cold calls. Yep. So referrals seem to be such an easy solution if you know how to get them. And when you do get them and then you make them work, they're very, very powerful yeah. because a referral refers you to somebody else because they've already been referred. Yeah. In business, finding new clients that way for me was always like the, the most obvious way of doing it. Mm. If you want to build your social media profile mm. and become somebody are you are you telling me that that's done it's almost too late um, is it almost or is it too late uh well there are ways through it so if you've had an extraordinary result some sort of amazing thing that you've done um you might get a little bit of cut through right if you if you if you've worked on some really well-known project, or if you've had a standout result, right? If you floated a company or if you've sold a business for a hundred million, or if you've done some, something that stands out. Um, and it's also tricky because under a certain age, anything that you do is impressive over a certain age, nothing you do is impressive. Um, that's a harsh reality as well. So there are certain people, you know, I'm 42 or 53 at our ages. Uh, there are people who run countries now, you know, there's presidents and prime ministers who are 42 and 53. So nothing we do is impressive anymore. Um, whereas at 29, if you register a company and set it up and make a first sale, that's quite impressive. So there's this kind of like a harsh gap that just deforms very rapidly in 10 years. Um, so you can get cut through if you've done something impressive. Um, you can get cut through if you're under the wing of someone who's already got cut through. 
so if you're working with someone who has a personal brand and you're intimately aware of how it works and what's happening and you're in the orbit of uh, all things that happen around a, a big name personal brand, you can get cut through because you're so close to the orbit of that. If you're a moon around Jupiter or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I know some, some people who work with very big name personalities and you can get cut through, you can slingshot from that, mm -hmm. um, into, into something, but it's, the world's about to get a bit harder because, you know, we, we're entering a world right now. AI is the dominant conversation. Um, and AI has two superpowers and superpower is superpower. Number one is to get people to hyper consume. So to consume more than they intended. So if you spend two hours doom scrolling on Facebook and t TikTok and, and all this sort of stuff, AI got you, right? It snuck into your head, figured you out. And it's, by the way, it's incredible how it does that. It builds a model of who you are and then it tests stuff against the model before feeding it to you. Um, and it keeps improving its model. And then, you know, it's basically doing this, like while you're watching one TikTok video, it's testing a thousand TikTok videos against a model of how you behave and then giving you the best performer out of those thousand. So it's awesome how it's doing it. So, Incredible. <clears throat> so one, one thing is hyper consumption mm -hmm. and the other one is hyper creativity and about five to 10% of people are going to be on the hyper creative side and about 80, 90% of people are going to be on the hyper consumptive side. So we're going to have this huge swathe of the population who just mindless zombies looking at their phones, consuming stuff, buying stuff they don't need, listening to stuff, watching stuff that they're not, you know, that's just pointless um, algorithmic success, successful algorithms, just jamming stuff down their throats. Um, and then you'll have this small group of people who use AI to, con uh, to create faster. They're creating, uh, intellectual property, media technology at speed, and they're just putting it into the marketplace. So the reason I say it's a bit too late is because if you're not already on that hyper creative bandwagon, yep. there's so many people who are, and AI is accelerating the speed at which they can create. So those 10% of people are now going to be able to create more than a hundred percent of the people could have previously created, mm -hmm. you know, their, their output is going to go through the roof. And when that happens and that's happening, there's just no way you can keep up with them. It's, it's going to be like, you're going from walking to hopping on your first bicycle. They're in a Ferrari, you know, you're not ever going to catch up and you're not going to steal any thunder from them. Um, you know, and that's where, that's where we are. So the, the train is moving out of the station as we speak. Has that happened before in business history where that's, that's yeah, the social media thing. So there was a, there was a moment where, you know, let's say you were using pub, uh, public relations and you were in PR and you were running ads in the paper and your whole business was running quarter page ads and getting PR and getting on the radios and the morning shows. And then suddenly the social media influencers come along and the, you know, the game shifts, um, you know, and yeah, they, there comes a time where, um, you know, you just, and then prior to that, there was getting, uh, getting into the media that if you weren't in the media, you weren't going to get in the media at a certain particular point in time. And, uh, you know, so these, these games do evolve and they do shift. The only worry that I have with the AI thing is it's so powerful that, um, I really do think that we're headed for a long period of haves and have nots that ultimately, um, there's those who use it to create who, who end up with a lot, uh, for, for 10,000 years, humans have always been haves and have nots. We've had the, like predominantly the agricultural age where whoever owned the land and owned the soil, uh, was the Kings and the Queens and the Lords and the Dukes and all those sorts of people. And everyone else was a serf or a pleb. Um, the soil is an artificial intelligence, uh, very similar to AI. Soil is a, uh, automation process. You put in a seed. And then automation takes over and it produces a tree with fruit and humans have no idea how this happens. We just know that if we put in a seed, up comes a tree and out comes fruit. So humans job is just plant seeds and pick fruit. And we don't know what happens in between. And it's very similar with AI. You put a prompt into the LLM, out comes, uh, an amazing piece of content. It grows a tree and produces fruit. You've got no idea how that, how the hell that happens. So. We now are going towards digital kings and queens, digital dukes and, and lords, and whoever owns the algorithms and owns the LLA, large language models, um, those people own the land and we're just on the land, right? So we, <laughs> we're, we basically plant seeds and pick fruit, but it's, you know, it, 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 
it takes us back to a feudalistic um, land style system. Interesting. <laughs> Upbeat stuff, huh? Like, well, yeah, it's, it's the analogy. I mean, I think a lot of the time, though, when when new stuff comes along, we 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 fear it, but then we find a way to regulate it, and whether that's in our own interests or not, you know, mm. we 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 saw that with you know COVID and the nonsense that existed yeah. there at the time, you know, all of the fear around it, it was yeah. regulated, and we find it not to be not to be anywhere near as damaging as it was, and you know, I talked to some people, and and AI is like this is this is a serious problem. Mm. You know, like genuinely a serious problem like people at google that i talked to. oh totally the it's closer like, you get to it the more yeah, you see that's a serious problem but like with anything there's always opportunities there's all no there's always opportunities and this is why i'm saying there is a small group of people who do very very well the hyper creators will do very well the other people who will do hyper hyper uh, the other people who do very well is the bottom two billion um so if you don't currently have access to healthcare gp if you if the if the idea of going to a doctor is extremely foreign to you, then AI is the best thing that's ever happened because AI is better than most doctors. Um, it can diagnose and give treatment plans and all of this sort of stuff. So you can turn um, a nurse in rural Uganda into a first world GP with if you've got AI in her hand. Um, so that you know that sort of things. Um, engineers and architects working in the developing world. Um, will be able to solve problems with a level of expertise um, up their sleeve that they've never had. So for the bottom, for the bottom billion to two billion, AI is an is an incredible uh, game changer, life changer um, that's coming. Uh, that that's definitely a positive. Mm. Well, I think some other positives exist as well. I've been following recently how they're using uh, AI to select stocks. Or to invest people's portfolios and doing better than the fund managers. Yeah. Well, I've been in the investment industry for thirty years. I know for sure, okay, based around how many funds are out there, that most fund managers never outperform the market mm. because number one, they have their sure. fat fees involved in it, yeah. and so they've got they've got that to factor in. But also, there's there's human error. Now, of course, there are some, but a very small percentage that are geniuses, yeah. talented people that literally know how to, you know, the magic, the, the sprinkle or the magic dust all over the opportunity and they turn it into something amazing. But the vast majority don't. And bringing that in, mm. okay, is exposing those people. Yeah. And exposing well, them. AI is already making most investment decisions on the planet. So Aladdin is the biggest fund manager in the world by a long shot. Um, and BlackRock's Aladdin. Um, and this is like, I think it's, I don't know how many trillions it's up to now, but it's the fund manager. One of the reasons I suspect we haven't had a recession when most people think we should have is because Aladdin is making very fast decisions to smooth out the bumps. Um, but yeah, well, no, we're already living in an AI-generated investment economy. But the the kind of the scary thing is, is that it's not scary. It's just, it's a change. But a lot of people's second, like a lot of secondary economies happen around very high-earning fund managers. You know, those high-earning earn there's thousands of high earning fund managers out there, you know, they pay school fees and they pay, um, you know, restaurants and all of that sort of stuff. So the, the interesting thing with AI is you get, once an AI is good at something, it can do it everywhere for no cost uh, at all times. So it, it can suddenly be, you know, if, if you take GPs, uh, for example, if an AI is better than G, every GP or better than 95% of GPs, um, and suddenly it gains that power and that people trust and, and appreciate AI GPs more than personal GPs, it's suddenly everywhere all the time at no cost. Mm -hmm. So suddenly you don't actually need that many GPs globally anywhere, anytime. So it's a, it's an interesting, um, yeah, it's an interesting, it's a really, it's at the moment, it's like trying to see around a corner. If you were to ask uh, someone who's on the field uh, in you know eighteen hundred. What's it going to be like in a post-industrial, um, post-agricultural age world? What's the what's what's an industrialized world going to look like? There's no way they could tell you. You know, if they're working on a farm and they're just seeing a steam tractor for the first time, they have no idea what it means when ninety percent of people who work on the field don't need to work on the field anymore. They you know they go into the city and they get these other jobs in factories. What's a factory? Uh, you know so. We can't see around that corner at the moment. We're living in an industrial age with an industrial age mindset. It's built into our psyche, demand and supply tension. It's built into our psyche, just the basics of 
component labor, all the things that are industrialized concepts are, are in our brain. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what it looks like around the corner when human labor and human intelligence is massively devalued. Interesting. If you, let's say you sold your businesses today, okay, out of all of those businesses, you're allowed to keep $200,000. The rest of the money had to go into trust for your kids, all right, for when you're when you croaked it <laughs> and you had to start a business today yeah what type of business would you start so rather than going through what type i'd go through a process so i've got playbooks and um having had a, n a number of businesses that have gone from start through to exit um i've developed playbooks and i would go back to my playbooks so the first thing is, is that uh so the first playbook is what i call chaos Chaos is concept audience offer sales. So concept is coming up with a, a range of concepts with a team. Ideally, you want to get four smart people in a room together mm -hmm. and you want to spitball some concepts. And you're looking for something that has a good origin story, mission, and vision. So um, uh, you're looking for what does my background indicate that I'd be good at? So origin story. Um, you, you, something that's very good for you might not be a good idea for me. And something that I come up with that's good for me based on my origin story might be a terrible idea for you. So you've got to have a good match, origin, mission, and vision. So we'd start with, let's have a look at our origin story. Let's have a look at background. What, what have we learned? What intellectual property are we sitting on? What are we credible at? Um, what could we assemble teams around? So we start with those sorts of questions. Come up with 10 ideas, pick the best uh, two or three and then we do step two, which is audience building. Um, can we build uh, an audience? How rapidly can we build an audience around any of these concepts? So let's say one of the concepts is um, we're going to do some marketing technology. So we might put together a um, marketing your small business group on Facebook or a marketing WhatsApp group, or we might create a, like a, a LinkedIn community or something like that. And we're just trying to see, can we get people to join a group, <laughs> right? And I want them to join a group. I want them to fill in a survey or a scorecard. And I want them to um, uh, attend a 30 to 60 minute event. So those are my three tests. Can I get people to join a group, fill in a scorecard, attend a 60 minute intro, free free Zoom event? If, I, if I'm getting a good velocity of people doing those things, then I'm like, okay, this, is, this has some legs. Um, if I push on doors and they seem like they fling right open, um, that's a great sign. If I want to go and get meetings with senior people and I tell them a little bit about what the concept is and they say, yeah, let's meet next week. Okay. These are good signs. So this is basically, this is just testing audience. Um, and then the, the third step is offer, constructing an offer based upon pain. I'm looking for what's the pain, what's the frustration, what is it that, um, people are hurting? Um, what, what are the little paper cuts that they get daily that they hate getting? Uh, I'm trying to identify those. So I'm constructing an offer and then I'm doing sales calls. Can we sell it? Can we actually make sales? So those are some of the first things I do in playbook number one. Um, the other thing, the other thing that a lot of entrepreneurs don't do is they don't go to the end state of exit and sort of explore what's right downstream. And I wish more entrepreneurs would do that. So I'll give you another thing I might do before I even start. I might go and talk to M and A consultants, uh, M and A uh, professionals who are buying and selling businesses. Um, and I'd go and say, what's, you know, what's selling? What's, what's valuable at the moment? What are people wanting to buy? What are, what are acquirers wanting to buy? What sort of, re you know, what sort of businesses, what sort of revenue, what's hot? Uh, so I'd try and get a little bit of feel, feelers there. I might talk to a CEO, CEO, uh, COO, CFO, uh, CMO of a large company and say, if I could wave a magic wand, what would you, what would you love to acquire? What sort of business would you love that isn't out there that you'd kind of be, uh, you know, or what's a problem that you wish could solve. Yeah. So this is kind of going right up the, up the stream. Mm -hmm. And, and that is going to inform those first 10 concepts as well. The con so when I say origin, mission, and vision, origin story is exploring your background and what you're capable of. Vision is exploring the exit and what's, what does it look like in 10 years from now? What, you know, what are we trying to build? So all of that's playbook one concept audience offer sales. Um, so, I'm going to go through a process. So rather than trying to come up with a home run idea, I'm going to follow and trust a trust a process uh, to 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 see what evolves. 
sounds like an enormous amount of common sense, but it's almost like when you, <laughs> but when you go, when you go back to, to your beginnings, you know, you worked for that guy. Then he said, if you want some shares, set your own company up. You mirrored that because you knew that would work. Yes. And so you're going out to find out what's popular by doing that research, you know, with the M and A guys and whatnot, you're, you're, you're yeah. essentially saying, well, what is working right now? Yeah. Okay. And how can I fit into that space in some capacity? Yeah. And, and I'm trying to balance personal feelings of passion. I'm trying to balance credibility based on my origin story with what the market wants. And it's a really delicate balance because if you just simply go chasing the latest thing, well, that train is probably already mis moved from the station anyway. Mm -hmm. So just going and talking to the M&A guys and saying, oh, you know, SaaS companies is really hot right now. Well, by the time you get a SaaS company set up, it might be, oh, sorry, AI companies are really hot right now. SaaS companies are yesterday. So, you know, the, it's not it's not a foregone conclusion that you can just simply go find out what's hot and then try and chase a trend. Chasing trends doesn't actually work. Having an awareness of trends is pop, pop, powerful, but you have to try and balance these other factors in as well. Should people be pursuing their passion or should they be pursuing what works? I think... It's very easy to be passionate about what's working. The brain is easily hacked. When, when my kids go into Mario Brothers and they discover that little box and it, all the coins come spilling out of that box, ding, 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 they get excited about Mario. They think Mario is a great game. Now, if they had to play three or four levels of Mario before getting any points or any coins or anything and there was just no dopamine along the way, They'd say this is a boring game. They're not passionate about it. So people are easily fooled about what their passion is, mm. right? Your passion is stuff that pays out rewards, right? So, um, you know, I see people say, oh, you know, I'm passionate about property. Okay, because you've had some really good wins with property. Oh, I'm passionate about the steel in the steel smelting, you know? <laughs> you know? Yeah, fantastic. So, f so definitely follow your passion if your passion is technology, steel, construction, M&A, finance, <laughs> you know, then if, if that happens to be your passion, definitely follow your passion. Um, if you're, you know, I see people who look my passion, snowboarding. I love being on the snow. I love being, I love being out there. Um, and anyone who goes snow skiing or snowboarding knows exactly what I'm talking about. When you hop off that lift at the top, uh, especially when you haven't been for a year and you just go, Oh, I'm here. I'm back. I'm back. And it's that literally on top of a mountain or that first time you just pelt it down the the, the, the run and you have this, I mean, my heart is on fire when I'm doing that. There's no business in that. You know, what, what am I going to do? Start a snowboarding business? No. Um, so following your passion is probably bad advice. Making sure that you can get passionate about what you do, um, is good advice. Uh, and it's like, it's also like a good relationship, right? Um, you have to be disciplined to invest in the relationship. And there, there's a natural curve at the beginning of any new relationship where it's magic and it's, it's beautiful and it's effortless and it's chemistry. And then it takes a bit of work. And most people would discover that they have a natural curve for something, but then when the work kicks in, it's still like, if I did start a snowboarding business, uh, I would have this initial honeymoon period and then I'd friggin' hate snowboarding for a while. All right. So I have to then have the discipline to get myself back passionate about it. So, uh, you know, I think credibility is a good one. Uh, you know, you have to have a story that works for that, for that thing. You've got to have a good origin story for why the business got started and why you're the right person to start it. Um, you have to be able to have the discipline to get yourself passionate. Um, the easiest way to get passionate is that it's paying out rewards. Um, you will get, you will get excited about anything that's giving you status or that's giving you money, um, or that's giving you love, recognition, adulation, you'll, you'll suddenly become passionate about that thing. Very natural to do so. I really believe that you should never be involved in, in something you're passionate about. It's like I say, it'd be good if you're good at something, then double down on that. You know, I, I, I'm, if you should go back to all of my history, I'm a salesperson yeah. you know, and it was office equipment. Then it became wealth management. And I bet, I bet you have a love hate relationship with sales. Like sometimes you love it because you're good at it. And sometimes you're like, oh, I've got to do this thing again. I don't know. Is yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. Well, but what I found over the years is that the, the, it gave me it gave great reward because I, I really, really, really focused on the science of sales. Mm. I got mm. really into it. And so 
as much as I might be listening to Zig Ziglar and uh, uh, and Jim Rowan and Tony mm. Robbins and all these other people around the world, you know, Brian Tracy's and whatnot. The fact is, I I I I believe that sales was the backbone of a business. Yeah. And because I believed that, you could never say anything to me, which made me feel bad for being a salesperson. Yeah. You know, yeah. most salespeople struggle with that. Yeah. And you're right. Like sales is the backbone of every business, even the ones that pretend it's not. Mm -hmm. No sales, no clients, no money, no, you know, no business. And so all the way down that journey, it was like, if I'm really good at this and it's such a critical part of business, then mm. I'm always going to have a job. And no matter how old I am, I've, I can always sell. Yeah. So if I lose it, I lose everything when I'm 65, I can start again because I can sell. Pick up the phone. Yeah. And so was, was I passionate about EC3, you know, every morning in the rain, uh, a raincoat, umbrella, briefcase, and um, knocking on doors. Getting told you know, to go away. Liverpool Street, Bishopsgate, you know, Fenchurch Street, all that nonsense around there, bank. And was I? No. Okay. But it was the buzz that came from once the yep. appointment was made and then the sale was made and yada, yada, yada. For, for me, when, when I look at, structuring how i've sold stuff online as mm -hmm. opposed to offline so you'll have yep. to forgive me here online has been far more difficult for me than offline because i i was in innately comfortable with everything offline yeah. because that's what i've learned yep. always um building audiences through my social media mm -hmm. i I, I thought to myself that everyone would be as passionate as me about what I was passionate about, you know? <laughs> and why wouldn't they be, for goodness sake? But but over the years, I've learned that sales, for example, that s n people don't like sales. Mm, they they're, don't. They don't like selling. They 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 don't like sales. They, in, like, they in, like the results. Yeah. In the UK, I call it ABS breaking. Anything but sales. Anything, okay, yeah. <laughs> Anything but sales. It's like, People don't want to be sold to. They don't want to learn how to sell yet. They they have these businesses where it's a critical skill required in their business. Yeah. So I found it difficult. You know, and I think that when it's described as something other than sales, sometimes people buy into it more. Mm. It's like, no. Influencing. In, yeah, yeah. Or you're in business. Yeah. You know, you know, it's, it's not sales. It's like acquiring clients. Um, you yeah, know, opportunity management. Yeah. Yeah. When, 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 do you client, client acquisition? Yes. Client acquisition. That's another <laughs> one. Yeah, client acquisition. Do you feel the same towards it? Uh, to, how do I feel towards sales? I love sales. Um, I think sales is a critical step. I geek out on sales. I love sales strategy. Um, I think it's a science. Um, I read reports. AI has done a great job of compiling millions of sales calls and seeing what works and transcriptions and all that sort of stuff. So I'm really geeking out on that stuff. Um, I, I, one of the, passions that I do have is trying to impress upon businesses that you cannot build a business with ABS breaking. You can't, you cannot avoid this thing. Um, and also I love to point out to businesses that the brands that they love are very sales focused brands. So if you like Rolex watches, guess what? The person who sells you a Rolex went to three days of Rolex boot camp. Um, they got uh, an enormous amount of product knowledge investment. Then they learn about relationship management. Then they learn about the Rolex system for making sales and and the scripts and all of those sorts of things. And they did role play and they all, all of that before they ever spoke to someone who could afford a Rolex. They went through this enormous process to get to the point where they could even just talk to someone. Um, if you'd like Apple Store, the Apple Store, you go into the retail store and you talk to the genius, uh, another name for a salesperson. Um, and, um, you don't know this, but they do 40 minutes of sales training a day, a day, a shift, every shift. So they have, you know how Peloton, oh, no, whoa, whoa, stop that. say that again. So, you know, Peloton, yeah. how they have one person doing the Peloton class and it gets beamed out on everyone's bike. Yeah. So Apple stores have got sales trainers who do sales training, which gets beamed out to the iPads of all the retail store. And all those retail store workers are doing 40 minutes a day every shift of sales training. Now it's a combination of product knowledge. It's a combination of um, uh, objection handling, problem solving for clients. They've got their own lingo and their own language, but it's essentially building rapport, um, you know, discovering a problem, finding out what the frustration is, giving people a suggestion that they can take home today. Take home today is a big part of the Apple retail uh, strategy. So they have to give you something that you can take home today uh, or one, one of their suggestions. So they've got all of all of that built in and they're doing 40 minutes of training with these kids every day. Uh, yeah, and this is Apple. 
you know, so we're so cool. Our brand is the most powerful brand in the world. Oh yeah. Okay. And we do sales. So, you know, Google's got armies of salespeople. If Google could automate the damn thing, they'd, they'd you know, get rid of all their salespeople. If ever you've redeemed one of those hundred dollar vouchers, you know, suddenly Brian from Bangalore calls you up and you've got, you know, you've got a sales call. Uh, so, you know, these biggest brands in the world, they're all sales organizations. So are you giving me some, some peace of mind here? <laughs> we're never going to be f able to fully automate sales. No, I'm not giving you that peace of mind. Um, it's going to, so I've got a shelf life. It's going to shift and evolve. So, you know, one of the things you were taught when you were first getting out there and selling is like building rapport. Now, a lot of that now happens online. The rapport that we build with people, um, is normally that they look at our LinkedIn, they look at our Instagram, they have a look at maybe a video that we've put on, on YouTube. And they start building a sense of who you are and where we might have chemistry before the meeting even starts. And you, you're seriously at a disadvantage or on the back foot. If, if I go and have a look at you online and there's not a lot there, then trying to make up for that in the first meeting, I'm at a, I'm at a disadvantage. On the flip side, let's say I go and have a look at your Instagram and there's 100,000 followers there and I go and look at your YouTube and you've got all these subscribers and great content and I go and look at your LinkedIn and you post every day a great piece of article. I can't wait to meet you, right? So the that first rapport building or credibility or authority building step of any sales meeting is now happening online. The second thing that could happen and does happen all the time is in a traditional sales meeting, I would ask you a lot of fact find questions mm -hmm. and I would say, tell me a bit about how this works and how did you do this? And how long does it take to go from this point to this point? Mm -hmm. And in traditional selling environments, uh, that's a normal step and all of those sorts of things. But in the sales environments we're going into, that step should have been done with an online assessment or it should have been done through an information gathering process. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, qualifying exactly. So for example, I have one of my big lead generation strategies is online scorecards. So online scorecards is that people fill in an online assessment. Um, so we have the key person of influence assessment. We have the campaign an analyzer. We have the 24 assets, digital transformation heat map. Um, and we've got these online assessments sitting out there. And these things just bring in hundreds and hundreds of warm qualified leads every week. And it's a huge part of how I've grown all the businesses, these online assessments. And when someone fills in an online assessment, they answer 30 or 40 questions about themselves and their business. And my salespeople pick up the phone and say, hey, look, it looks like you've said that you've got an issue around X, Y, and Z. And it looks like, you know, you answered a few of these questions really negatively and you've got a bad score on this one. What are you doing to improve that at the moment? Um, would you like some help and support with that particular thing? So what's interesting is that my sales team are jumping probably traditionally we're jumping halfway into the sales call on the first minute right so let's let's say we go back to to the year 2000 the first 30 minutes of a sales meeting is building rapport establishing credibility and fact finding about the client mm -hmm. right so all of that maybe, maybe even more but yeah yeah and now my sales team they're leveraging our social print media profile which is getting a rapport which has already built the rapport they're using the data that we gathered through the online assessment. And minute one, they're talking about what you've already told us is your problem. So they're going straight into, hey, we've already seen that you've got this issue. The data is telling us this. We've already done our research. We've got AI that's pulled together a bit of information about you. Um, we've already we've already started using AI, generative AI to create some solutions for you. You know, right? Now imagine that. Imagine I imagine by five minutes in we've actually used generative AI to come up with six or seven key ideas for how you'd solve your problem specifically to you. Incredible. Yeah. Like incredible. Yeah. So that, so when we say, where, where does the credibility start though? Online, social media. So, so my sales guys say I'm calling on behalf of Daniel Priestley, who they've been following for years on my social media profiles. And they go, ah, oh, fantastic. Oh, Dan, I know Daniel. I've been watching his videos just recently. I just watched that podcast he did with Spencer. It was amazing. Right? Yeah. So the credibility is already built there. And then, hey, I'm, I'm calling on behalf of Dan. Uh, and, uh, you know, it says here that you read one of Daniel's books. Oh, fabulous. Yeah, let's talk. All right. So the credibility is created online. The fact find is created online. You know, so all of these steps are happening digitally. 
And then the final piece is putting it all together. You know, so we can have really powerful sales conversations now in about 30, 40 minutes that used to take us an hour and a half. Go to the front end then and talk about the content that needs to be created in that example. We've got generative AI, but there's obviously some 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 content. So that let's has talk, to... yeah, front end content. There's two pieces of research that are very interesting here. Um, so there's Google's research, which they called Zero Moments of Truth. And there was um, Professor Robin Dunbar's research, which is um, famously Dunbar, Dunbar's Numbers. And both of these pieces of research say similar things. And that is that people feel a sense of trust, credibility, likability after a certain amount of time and interactions. So here's the here's the averages. The average is that people have to interact with you 11 times, according to Google's research, before they feel enough trust to buy from you. Mm -hmm. So before I want to buy a new pair of uh, shoes, let's say I, I recently just bought some really great hiking boots, right? Uh, I ended up, I was juggling between Mammut and uh, Scarpa. And I did what everyone does, which is I've got a few browser tabs open with different um, oh, <laughs> hiking oh boots, exactly what you right? <laughs> and I'm reading reviews and I'm yeah. going through and I'm going to a little bit, oh, there's a YouTube video about this. I'll watch that. I'd probably invest tens of thousands of dollars worth of my time in a 200 pound decision, right? Yeah. So, um, but, I'm, but I've got my tabs open and all this sort of stuff. So Google analyzes this and they basically say, before you go and buy those Scarpa boots, you've touched that brand 11 times. You've, t you've gone and, and you've consumed 11 different things um, before you feel comfortable to buy. So this is the average across consulting firms, every, all, all sorts of stuff is, is 10.7 interactions. Professor Robin Dunbar, he looked at it a different way. He said seven hours um, or four locations. So by the time you're buying from someone that you trust and that you feel good about buying from them, you've clocked up seven hours across four platforms. Uh, and that puts... Of content consumption. Seven, seven hours. hours. Yeah. Seven hours... Subconsciously as well as consciously. Seven hours puts you into a category of acquaintance with... In Dunbar's numbers, you've got 1,500 people who you might be able to put a name and a face to, right down to five people who are your closest inner circle family members, right? So you've got these concentric circles of, of relationships. So Robin Dunbar basically says you've got to get into the acquaintance level if you want to sell something. So that, that is about a seven-hour average. Um, so the people who are in the acquaintance level uh, they have, over the last, I think it was six months, spent seven hours um, of contact. So if you've clocked up 11 interactions, seven, so I always use 7.11.4, seven hours, 11 interactions, four platforms. So if you want to be super confident that you can clock up relationships with people, you want to make sure that online there is seven hours, 11 interactions, and four locations or platforms that people can go down the rabbit hole if they want to. Not everyone's going to do that. Some people might listen to one hour and go, love it, amazing. That already aligns to what I've already been thinking about. It's a perfect fit. I'm ready to buy. That's a that's on one end and someone else might want to spend months going down the rabbit hole and consuming stuff. Uh, for my company, the average uh, time for someone to enter the database to buy something is five and a half months. Uh, so people typically read a book, watch some videos, take a scorecard, talk to someone, and then they buy. And it all happens on average around five months. Uh, so we have a 7.11.4 ecosystem surrounding all of my businesses. And that 7.11.4 ecosystem is refreshed and it's designed that if anyone wants to spend the 7.11.4, they can. So it's almost like a vineyard where the wine, the grapes are pulled, they've got to ferment. If there's time, you know, you have to give these this time. But if you're constantly bringing grapes in and you're constantly doing it, yeah. then you're just going to have this this motor. But that that period of time that people have between starting that journey and something spouting out the other end that's that's that's, that's a credible and worthy and and qualified prospect. Mm. Um, requires some patience based upon that. Yeah, but the beauty of digital assets is that you create them once and then they immediately transcend time, space, and wear and tear. They're, they're suddenly everywhere. They're available all the time and you can use them over and over and over and they lose no quality. So this podcast, we, you know, we're recording it now and someone might be listening to this in the year 2027 mm -hmm. um, and uh, it might be doing some good job you know, at some point in the future. So what's nice is that realistically having you know, some videos, some podcasts, some books, some reports, if you create them well and they, you create them with a little bit of longevity in mind, 
you've got yourself an ecosystem that builds and builds and builds. And so with that in mind, how, how do you then go about using using the content? Do you be, are you obsessed with creating content on a on a on a minute by minute basis? Is it is it you know a big part of your planning with you and your businesses with what you do? You know, do you say I need to produce X amount of content on a no no? no. I, I'm obsessed with customer problems. Um, I'm obsessed with the idea that there is a customer out there that's got a problem, they're frustrated, they experience regular little daily frustrations and pains. Um, and okay, well, let's say let's say there was a there were there were ten customers that were, there were ten problems. Yeah. Okay. Would you then understand those problems in detail and then be creating content to solve them? Yeah, yeah solve absolutely. Them. In service of solving the problem, I'll yeah. create endless amounts of content. It's so, um, it's so, what I'm not about is I'm not about photographing my breakfast and um, you know filling people's pipeline, filling people's awareness with you know stuff that I don't want to do narcissistic stuff. You know, I'm not a big I don't want to chase the spotlight. I want to shine the spotlight on something valuable. Mm -hmm. So rather than trying to, you know, run around saying, look at me, I want to be saying, Hey, look, you know, that problem you've got, go look at this, that this is the thing you need to look at. Is that where most people with their social media content get it wrong? Do you think? Yeah. They look at some of the people who have become a brand like a Gary or, a, um, you know, or an, a, any of the influencers like a Mr. Beast or something like that. And they're looking at people who, um, have basically built a following of people who are following that person and they're looking at that as the model, but you know, only a very small number of mostly good looking or really well-spoken like me and you like us, Okay, good. only those people can do it. Only we could do that. But for mo most people, that's not the model. What people want is they want things that meet their needs. They're, they're, you know, people are going around their busy lives. They've got their own families to worry about. If they're looking at photos, they want to look at photos of their kids and their, you know, their families. They don't want to look at your breakfast. Um, so what they want is things that help them solve problems. It's interesting, you know, when you look at numbers of con uh, or consumption numbers on, on social media channels, YouTube in particular, you know, there might be a guy that's uh, showing someone how to change a bulb in the front lamp of, of his car, yeah, of his 19, you know, 89 classic car, but it's got 500,000 views. Now, obviously, there's the people that found it by mistake, but there's the people out there that are like, that's the problem I'm trying that, to solve. I, that, cheers, mate. Thank you. Know. you. Appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, you helped yeah. me. Yeah. Oh, oh, and I can get that new bulb from XYZ Bulb Shop. Yep. You know, here's the, Am too. here's the Amazon affiliate link. Yeah. <laughs> And so, so solve the problem, but then, then the, it's, are these real problems? And so you have to be looking for real problems that yeah. people have. This is where, why I said before, I, I, I have this silly saying about licking people's faces. Like you want to get so close to the customers, you know, you, you, I, I, you know, I joke about, you know, get so close, you could lick their face. It's like, you want to be so close that you understand the problem, how they language the problem, how, how the problem impacts other areas of life, what it feels like when the problem sets in, what it feels like a day later, um, you know, how they think about the problem, you know, how they remember the problem from the past. You want to really like immerse yourself in what, what the customer experience is because you're building something that is that perfect fit for them. And you're trying to find the right communication style that makes them excited that that problem is going to go away. This is a fantastic conversation. I'm really, I'm really enjoying this. It's been some of it's been schooling, some of it's been, and and hopefully you're getting great value out of this too, because literally, so so many businesses struggle, and so many people are out there producing content. I mean, it drives me mad producing content that is of no value or benefit to anyone. Yeah, you know, it it really isn't. You Unless know? you're really good looking. <laughs> yeah. there, there's two types of content that, that, that I produce. One, one, one every morning I, I, on Instagram, I post that I'm going to the gym at five o'clock. Not in the gym, but out on my way. Accountability. Yeah. Just yeah, calling people up. And the messages I get from people, because I've asked before, like, if I do this content and you don't like it, I'm sorry. If you do like it, let me know. Okay. And the responses I get from people is like, I would not get up if it wasn't for you. you wow. Know? I hate you every morning because <laughs> when I wake up, you're going, get to, get to the effing gym, you know? And so people say that, but also some very deep messages where people are like, you know, I've struggled with depression and it's the gym that saves me and it's you that makes me go to the gym or, or stuff like that. Nice. So I know that there's some meaning to some people. Isn't that interesting though? As you say, it's the meaning to them. You're solving a problem for them. There's something about that content that is for them. It's not your 
they're not just sitting there going, oh, I'm tuning in and watching you. It's having an impact on on the way they feel. It's having an impact on how they solve the problems that are relevant for them at that time. So you you are, even though you're showing yourself go to the gym, you're doing something for them. Um, and that's and that's why it works. Yeah. There's no, they're, 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 I have this... I have this overwhelming urge for people to get up and exercise. I don't care what it is. Go for a walk. I have this overwhelming urge because I know, I, I feel, I don't know, but I feel that most people are stagnating and most people are existing. And, and I don't want them to do that. I want people to be in, in a better state of mind. And I know for me, dealing with the challenges I've had over the years, that getting up in the morning and going to do some exercise makes all the difference to me. Now, of course, there are people out there going, oh, you spend a lot, you know, you can just shove it up your ass. You know, there are people out there doing that, but... but They probably but... missed the broadcast. <laughs> yeah. They've probably got, they're on a night shift. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, the, it's like, because I have this kind of, like, and I can't shake it from my own mind. It's like, people need to do this. Mm. Okay. And it, it's like when I've been you know, in the financial services industry, it's like, I was the fifth emergency service. There, there, there was no way around that I could see it any differently. You've got the ambulance, the fire brigade, you've got the police, you've got the automobile association, and you've got me. And I was going to stop you effing up your finances, okay? Mm. I, was, that, and I was so completely locked into that. Uh, but the reality is most people do have a terrible relationship with money. There's psychology around yeah. it. Most people live in credit card debt. People, people have got all kinds of nonsense going on in their lives that they don't need to have. And it's like, I see that's a problem that people have. And if I can lead people to a solution... Okay, yeah. that, that can help them. Of course, they're not all going to engage, and of course, they're not all going to take action. But at least they know there's a path there. They know someone's passionate about. It. They know someone's in their corner. Mm. Yeah, absolutely beautiful, Daniel. Mate, this has been absolutely fantastic. I've loved chatting every minute of you. I'm so it's taken two years to get hold of you and get you in, in this room with me. But thank you so much for coming to join us today. I, I really love being on this podcast. Cheers. <laughs>